सोम सद्गमय तम सोम ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शांति 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 ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 om sthapakaya cha dharmasya sarva dharma swarupine avatara varishthaya rama krishnaya te namo good morning and namaste everybody good morning swami we are actually um close to the birthday of sri ramakrishna day after tomorrow is the birthday of sri ramakrishna by the indian calendar uh, in the english calendar it is uh, 18 february uh, in 1836 but because it's a lunar calendar it keeps changing if you see it from the perspective of the Eng- english calendar so we are already in march now um it's 3 days after shivaratri that's a good way of uh, reckoning it <laughs> So I thought today we'll talk about Sri Ramakrishna and we'll talk about what is most essential to Sri Ramakrishna. When you see Sri Ramakrishna, the life of Sri Ramakrishna, the story of Sri Ramakrishna, the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, and that which has come down to us, um, the most essential thing. In his own words, he said, "I, I swear it on the name of the Mother. For him, God was Mother. I do not know anything but God." Bengali he said, "I'm Irish, Bolchi. I'm Bhagwan Chada, Ishwar Chada. Kichu jani na ami. I do not know anything except God, and his life shows that, immersed in God. Just contemplating that life, listening to the stories of that life, is a very powerful spiritual practice. So that's what we'll do today. It's story time, but a divine story time." and it's a very powerful spiritual practice just to sit back and quietly listen and visualize it visualize it so we are going to go back to 1850s uh, in the kali temple of dakshineshwar uh, which had been established by rani rashmani this is uh, on the bank of the ganga uh, near It's on the bank of the Ganga near uh, Calcutta, and Rani Rashmani had established this um, um, Kali temple. Already had become quite popular among uh, devotees, among wandering monks, pilgrims. They would stop over, and uh, Sri Ramakrishna had been hired as the priest in the main temple, the temple of Kali. He had come with his brother, but then ultimately he became the priest of Kali, the worshipper. Um, One must remember he was very young at that time, 1856, around the time when we are joining the story. He was just what, 20 years old, 20 years old. Yes, very young. Now it, um, this young man was seized with a peculiar ambition, a spiritual ambition, that I should be able to see God. And for him, God was the divine mother Kali there. in hinduism you know i often characterize hinduism by saying that uh, whatever question you ask in religion in hinduism the answer is always yes and no do hindus worship god yes and no there are streams of hinduism which which are non decidedly non theistic <coughs> um is god male yes and no there is a very strong tradition of the worship of the divine feminine and i was just thinking about sri ramakrishna for him throughout his life god was primarily mother he his the whole story which we will talk about today we'll uh, confine ourselves to that main part of the story which is in the kali temple or temple dedicated to the worship of god as mother and set up by rani rashmani um, the um, i mean rani means a queen she was a kind of a minor royalty and she's a very uh, powerful very um, um, you know a uh, independent a uh, very intelligent a very competent uh, lady who set up this temple 
So technically, Ramakrishna was her employee. <laughs> so there was Rani Rashmani. And I was thinking, we'll meet some of these characters as we go along. Uh, his first formal guru in, in a technical sense was a woman, Bhairavi Brahmani. He's in, again, in technically, if you see, his first student actually was his own wife, Sharada Devi. So you see the pervasion of the divine feminine in the story of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, someone analyzed this. He says, this is the age to come. He was an avatar comes at the um, junction of ages and showing what is to come in uh, years, you know, in the, uh, decades and centuries to follow. Just day before yesterday, I was giving a talk on International Women's Day. And it's not uh, coincidental, you know, it's what has happened in the last hundred years. I can't prove it to you, but it is this uh, new awakening. And I personally am convinced, if you trace it back to the advent of the incarnation of Sharada Devi Sri Ramakrishna, and there are actually quite good arguments, and I think in the, in the future, in centuries to come, decades and centuries to come, this will become more and more an accepted fact. Anyway, so Sri Ramakrishna, 1850s, he's a priest of uh, Kali, and he's, he wants to see, that, are you just an image? Are you just a symbol, an image, or are you real? Yes, you can have all the, the abstract philosophy. This, this symbol of the Divine Mother, what the arms stand for, what the eyes stand for, and what the, the tongue uh, stands for, and all of that, if you see this iconography, and all of that is great. But it's, is it just symbolic? Is it just something standing for some deep philosophical concepts? Or is there a living divinity present here? And he, he was convinced that she's there. But she, he only need ask and she will reveal herself. She will um, um, show, uh, you know, she'll give, her, give him the desired vision of God. And he would pray that, Mother, um, you reveal yourself. You, uh, you gave your vision to um, Ram Prasad and others, the poet saints of Bengal who were worshippers of Kali. Why will you not give me the same vision? Why will I, why, why, why will I not be able to see you? He would pray and pray, he would weep and cry. But it's not that he just wept and cried. Um, whatever spiritual practice was available, he grabbed onto it. That if just by this way, maybe I'll be able to see God. He used to give a, give a teaching, you know. He said, see, for those who are thirsty, dying of thirst, any source of water, even if it doesn't seem very clean, you will remove the moss on the surface and drink water because you're terribly thirsty. Uh, if you're not particularly thirsty, it's only alpine water, which is, <laughs> I can't drink anything else. You're not that thirsty, that means. <laughs> so Sri Ramakrishna said, in spiritual life, it's exactly that. We are looking for the best guru. Uh -huh. Mr. Most Views on YouTube. Uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, the best uh, best sellers in, uh, on Amazon on spiritual life, the greatest masters, because after all, nothing but the best will do for me because I'm such a great spiritual seeker. <laughs> well, no, you are not. <laughs> I remember one gentleman who, when he took initiation, he asked his guru um, that, uh, uh, have you seen God? Just the same question which Narendranath would ask Sri Ramakrishna many, many years later. And Sri Ramakrishna, of course, famously said, yes, I have, and so can you, as I see you even more clearly. But when this gentleman, he said, I asked my guru, who eventually became my guru, I asked him, have you seen God? He looked at me with a twinkle in his eyes and he said, neither are you Vivekananda nor am I Ramakrishna. <laughs> we are made for each other. <laughs> So he did tremendous amount of spiritual practices, meditation, japa, ritualistic worship, um, tantra, yoga, whatever he could, you know, whatever teacher he could find, whatever, any way of e experiencing God. So he did that. Um, at that time, his nephew, Ridai Ram, was there who, who would take care of him. And we have many accounts from Ridai Ram and, of course, from Sri Ramakrishna himself. So Sri Ramakrishna would... Um, um, pray, uh, there are descriptions of Sri Ramakrishna at, at dusk. This is the temple garden on the bank of the Ganga. 
So this priest, he is on the bank of the Ganga, weeping piteously and throwing himself on the ground, rubbing his face in, uh, in the, um, uh, you know, on the sand, on, on the, like the, there's a narrow beach strip just before the river. Until his face would get cut and he would weep for, for mother. And the people of the temple, they would gather around and commiserate with him. They thought he is a homesick boy from the village. He had come from Kamarpukur. So he's missing his mother. He's crying for his mother. And you must remember he was a young boy, 20, I mean he was a young man, 20 years old. So they didn't know that he was actually crying for God. And Sri Ramakrishna said, a, a, a divine madness took possession of me until one day in the temple of Kali. Um, I, I was driven to despair. A great pain was there in my heart and my eyes fell upon the sword which was hung on the, uh, on the side wall of the temple where it is still there. And I thought, let me end my life because I will not get the vision of Kali. Let me end my life. And he, like a man possessed, he ran to catch hold of the st sword you know, with the idea of that he's going to cut his own throat in front of Kali. And then he said, I was overwhelmed. Then it happened. Um, he said, I saw these streams of light everywhere, flooding the temple, uh, emanating from the image of the Divine Mother and flooding the temple and everything around. The river, the temple outside, the river outside, sky and the earth everywhere. And they came like waves, this is his uh, description, waves of molten silver light, light till I was engulfed and finally I lost outer consciousness. Um, one thing here, we come across this again and again in the li life of Sri Ramakrishna. When he goes into Samadhi, it's written he lost consciousness. He didn't. What it means is he lost awareness of the external world. He lost awareness of the body. And here is something subtle. There was no internal thinking going on, thinking, feeling, seeing. One might say, yeah, that you're just talking about unconsciousness. No. No. This is the big difference. He is entire, he was all consciousness, but no object remains to experience. So then, you know, it's interesting. He wanted to see the see Mother Kali. It's right above here at the picture. That's what he wanted to see, actually. You can't see it. Later you can come and take a look. That's the Kali of Dakshineshwar. Uh, but what he had seems to be a very impersonal experience. It's like luminosity and great bliss. But afterwards, when he came to uh, an awareness of the external world, he said, mother, mother. So pro po uh, possibly he had a personal experience, like in the form of Kali also, as the presence of the mother. And from, th from then on, till the end of his life, in 1886, immersed in God. It became real for him. And not just one experience. Day and night. Day and night. Um, he continued the worship. But the worship was an extraordinary worship. And there was tremendous power in the place. Mathur Babu, who was the son-in-law of Rani Rashmani, who was a very um, competent man of the world, but also very devoted, he ran all the affairs of the temple. And he was specially struck by this young priest. He felt, he said, uh, he would call this young priest, who was, much young, was actually younger than him, would call him Baba, father. So he will, here we have an, like a treasure, you know, who will awaken the mother very soon. So we have this concept in um, spiritual practice in Hinduism, the deity is awakened. Or the mantra which you are re repeating, the mantra is awakened. By practice, um, by an advanced spiritual adept. So God is present everywhere, but it becomes specially manifest. And you can feel it. One person does it, everybody else gets the benefit of it. And people there in the, in the temple, they're, they're recorded and they're, they, for example, Ridai, Sri Ramakrishna's own nephew, and who was a very worldly man actually. And, but he loved his uncle. And he played his part. So he said, in those days, you could feel it. Something awesome was happening in the temple. You could feel it all the time when you went into the temple. And the same image, same worship is going on and all of that. But you could feel it palpably, a thick atmosphere in the temple. And he says, especially when uncle was around. Now, there was something going on. Uh, Christopher Isherwood in his book, Ramakrishna's Disciples, he uses an interesting term. He says, 
an appalling power was manifest there. <laughs> it's appalling. Yeah. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he sat for meditation and he would be locked in meditation for hours. Now the worship has to end at a particular time. And the attendants in the temple and the officials of the temple and the other junior priests, and they all were upset with him because he's throwing the whole uh, thing out of gear, you know. Um, and they didn't know what to say. They sort of sensed that this young priest is, uh, they were very clear that he's crazy. But he is a special favorite of Mathur Babu, the big boss. So they didn't dare to say much. Uh, he was, Mathur Baba was a formidable character and so was the queen, uh, Rani Rashmari. So they, they didn't dare say much but they didn't like it one bit because it's very unorthodox. He, they would see him, the food offerings which would be placed before the image of Kali. He would, so there's a special way of offering it. He would offer it the way it is supposed to be offered but then he would take up a little bit of the food and go to the face of the image and near the lips, mother eat, mother eat. You know, He would stand there. As if the image is going to eat. For him, probably it was. And sometimes he would say, what? I have to eat first, then you'll eat? All right. Then he would take a morsel in his mouth and to the horror of <laughs> all the priests all around. Sometimes he would, the flowers to be offered at the feet, he would offer it on his own head. Uh, once a cat came mewing into the um, inner sanctum. It entered. And the food offering was about to start. I think the cat was hit, had a target on that. And... Sri Ramakrishna, instead of shooing away the cat, he says, Mother, you have come. Do you want this? And he fed the cat with the food meant for the, for the worship of Kali. Again, to the all these uh, scandalous stories floating around in the temple. You know, you know what he has done now? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was like that. Uh, it, was, uh, it was all over the social media. You know? <laughs> have you heard what's going on in the temple with the, with the new priest? And it went on like this. And uh, Riday Ram said, I was terrified because I was sure the word of this would get back to the big boss, you know, and then we would be in trouble. Um, this offering of food, I have seen many monks, especially so many senior monks have this practice. Whatever they eat, they offer it first to, um, to God. And we sort of, it becomes mechanical for us. We offer it and then we, we take it as prasad, as offered food, prasad. Um, but I've seen some of the senior monks, they take it very seriously. I knew this one monk, much older than me, and he was notorious in the monastery because uh, when you serve food to him, he was very elderly, he, he was, and on top of that, he was blind in both eyes, and uh, both legs were paralyzed. In his, and and the, literally, the, one of the happiest people I've ever seen. It is an object lesson in what is meant by bodilessness. Bodilessness does not mean you go out of the body like a puff of smoke or something. That's cartoonish. What it means is having no concern for this physical body. Being entirely a being of, of spirit. I literally saw this. I, I was in the, actually, I was in the hospital and this Swami, old Swami was also in the hospital. The oldest patient, I was the youngest at that time, particular time. Blind, paralyzed. This old man, a monk who has no family, no money, no nothing, but so happy. Never one, ever one complaint from his lips. But anyway, he was notorious for this one reason. It was Im almost impossible to feed him. Why? You'd give his food and uh, then he would, he would take it uh, like this and, and he would sit like this. He would offer it mentally to Sri Ramakrishna probably. And he would wait until he felt that Sri Ramakrishna had accepted it. So in the monastery, even now, they have horror stories of offering, getting his plate and because somebody else has to clear it up after the Swami eats. You give it to him um, at, at noon, he'll probably eat at 3 p.m. He'll sit like that for one, two, three hours <laughs> until he feels that Sri Ramakrishna has accepted it. Uh, so um, Sri Ramakrishna would, would do that in the image of Kali. Um, these uh, stories got around, of course. And both Mathur Babu came to hear about it and uh, um, Rani Rashmani. Rani Rashmani in a rather shocking way. One day she came. Uh, she's the owner of the whole place. She came to the temple and she wanted to go. She took a um, holy bath in the Ganga. Then she went to the temple. Sri Ramakrishna had performed, the, I think, the evening worship. And, the, and then Rani asked him to sing a few devotional songs to the mother. Uh, he had a extraordinarily melodious voice. Many people have uh, recorded this. 
uh, so Sri Ramakrishna started singing and then he looked at the Rani and to the horror of everybody in, in full public in front of everybody he slapped her and said what to think of such things here also the women attendants of the Rani screamed and the guards came rushing with their you know in those days they were not armed with machine guns they were armed with sticks they were about to drag the priest away but when the Rani said stop uh, he's done the right thing and later she would explain she had just she was worried about um, a court case she was fighting a legal battle and she was thinking about that while sitting in the temple and Sri Ramakrishna somehow actually he could clearly she was amazed to see that he could clearly see my mind and thinking nothing of it he, <laughs> he slapped her in front of everybody one monk told me the way we meditate Sri Ramakrishna's hands would be stinging all the time <laughs> by, by <laughs> slapping all, all of us But the Rani said, no one's to touch him. Uh, now, many interesting things would, would uh, happen. Sri Ramakrishna said, for example, uh, when, um, you know, uh, many unorthodox things, he would take off his sacred thread, which a Brahmin is never supposed to do, even take off his wearing cloth and sit naked under a tree and meditate against scandalizing people there. Um, he, they saw him in order to remove all identification, uh, uh, the pride of being a Brahmin, a, a caste pride. He went secretly at night to the, the, the latrine of the sweeper of the temple, who was supposed to be low caste and all of that. You know, the very casteist kind of feeling at, in those days. And with his long matted hair at that time, he cleaned the, um, uh, the uh, toilet of, 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 the, of the sweeper to remove all feeling of that I am a Brahmin and superior. He sat famously sat on the bank of the Ganga and he would throw clods of earth and rupees, money, coins into the river saying money and uh, clay, uh, money and clay, uh, taka mati mati taka. This clay and this money is equally worthless. A wit later uh, quipped, he said, he knew that real estate would become very valuable one day. So he was trying to say that <laughs> it's as valuable as money, even this clay. <laughs> no, anyway, but um, I mean, there are so many amazing stories. One of the people who came and there were other teachers who came before the Bhairavi Brahmani and all. Um, a famous uh, incident happened when a wandering monk came uh, whose name was Jatadhari. So he was a worshipper of Rama. And uh, um, he had this little image of Rama, the baby Rama. So the baby Rama in North India is called Ramlala. You know the, uh, the installation of the image in Ayodhya, the, what was in the news? So the image there is called Ramlala. That is Rama as a baby. So, so this, uh, why would you do that? This is one way of devotional worship. Just like in Christianity, you have the baby Jesus. Why? Because um, in devotional worship, there are different moods. Okay, stepping back a little. Uh, in Vedanta, what we do is, when, if you are going to be devo practice devotion, uh, the, the idea is to divinize our relationship with human beings and humanize our relationship with the divine. So humanize our relationship with the divine. What relationships we have with other human beings. That you set up with God. So, for example, uh, master and servant. Hanuman uh, is considered himself a servant and Rama is the master. God is my master, I am the servant. That's one relationship. And you can develop this kind of a relationship with God. Or friend. Uh, so, Arjuna and Krishna. Arjuna considered Krishna to be a friend. So, God is your buddy, the best friend, you know. <laughs> then... Um, Vatsalya, so a parental attitude towards God. So God is your baby. So the uh, attitude of uh, uh, Yashoda towards Krishna, uh, or Ramlala, the baby Rama, or the baby Jesus and uh, Mother Mary, and that you cultivate towards God. It doesn't matter whether you are a, a woman or a man, you can cultivate that towards God. Um, 
And that's what the Jatadhari, the monk, had towards the baby Rama. Or the reverse of it. You can consider yourself a child and God as the parent. So in Christianity, for example, God is the father. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna had the same attitude towards God. God is the mother. And so his predominant attitude throughout his life was, I am the child and God is the mother. Uh, and there is also the uh, attitude of the lover, of the, uh, the bridal or the uh, beloved. So Radha and Krishna, for example. Uh, and there is finally something called the, uh, the very preliminary one is the Shanta, the peaceful attitude, the uh, attitude of a, like a philosopher saint. You contemplate uh, God as uh, this presence. And notice each one is more and more intimate, more and more human and more and more intimate. So servant, uh, master, closer is friends, closer still is parent, child, both ways, parent, child, child, parent. And even closer is the attitude of the beloved. So Jatadhari had the attitude of, um, uh, of, of a father with Ramlala, with a little boy, uh, Rama. And so when he comes, this is a very small image. When he comes, Sri Ramakrishna with his uh, insight, immediately. This is one other thing about highly advanced spiritual seekers, adepts, enlightened people. They recognize each other just like that. They sense it. Even without seeing sometimes, they would sense the presence. I have seen this happen in, with my own eyes. One monk and another monk, this other monk, an elder monk is coming and this younger monk suddenly says in front of me, says to that some, the older monk, hey, you, 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 you have it, don't you? And that monk looks startled and it breaks out into a broad smile and he said, yes, and you too? <laughs> and they look into each other's eyes and they embrace. So they see something directly there, something extraordinary, the presence of the divine in this person blazing forth through the eyes of this person. It's possible. Um, Sri Ramakrishna would sense it immediately. He sensed that this monk was an enlightened monk. And he went uh, out to meet him. And he was fascinated by the way this monk bathed the image, worshipped the image, offered food to the image, spoke to the image, and had a continuous vision of the little boy. When Sri Ramakrishna sat next to him, to his amazement, he would see the baby Rama as a little boy, not just the image, as a little boy who would play, crawl around as a toddler, who would play with, uh, um, with the, that monk. And then that little boy Rama, Ramlala, noticed Sri Ramakrishna. And then was this tremendous attraction, uh, would run to him, climb on his lap, play. And Sri Ramakrishna, when he started going back to his room, uh, the Ramlala followed him and Sri Ramakrishna scolded him and kept ordered him to go back to that, uh, to that monk, Jatadhari. But he followed him to his room. And Sri Ramakrishna said, he would hang around with me <laughs> all day long whenever he could, you know. Sometimes with the Jatadhari, sometimes with me. I would see him, actually see him qua uh, qua crawling around the room. I would offer him food to eat. Uh, he would play. He would sometimes tug at my cloth and to draw my attention. And then we would go to, nobody else saw any of this. Uh, and so all of these stories were told by Sri Ramakrishna to the disciples later on. And of course, the priests in those days who were there, they also knew that something like this was going on. So this is one uh, aspect of it. He said, when I would go to bathe, he would come with me. And he would take a dip in the Ganga and I would scold him. Don't stand there for so long. You'll catch a fever. You'll catch a cold. Don't play in the rocky ground there, in the stony ground. You'll uh, get blisters on your feet, my child. And he said, he was very naughty. He wouldn't listen to me. And he says, uh, once I gave him a couple of smacks because he wouldn't come out of the, uh, of the river. And I felt so bad. He looked at me with, suddenly with those large eyes with, with full of tears. And I immediately took him on my lap and consoled him. Um, Jatadhari was not jealous. Jatadhari at first was taken aback. He had never seen this happen. That another person actually saw what he was seeing. But he really liked Sri Ramakrishna. And uh, he got used to... Uh, Ram Lala uh, staying with Sri Ramakrishna more and more. Um, there was another story which Sri Ramakrishna told of one day when uh, he offered, uh, oh, Ram Lala kept on pestering that he was hungry. There was no food at that time particularly in, uh, in, in his room, Sri Ramakrishna's room. So he said there was only some coarse rice. He said, I gave that to the child. Again, in the vision. I gave that to the child and it was not husked properly. 
So when he ate it, it cut his inner lip a little bit. And he said, I felt so bad, a pain in my heart. Immediately I took him on my lap and I said, your mother fed you with butter and cream and look what I have fed you with this coarse, uh, coarse rice. Now, Swami Saradanandaji narrates decades later, Sri Ramakrishna narrating this story to the young disciples sitting around. Decades later, saying that I fed him with this coarse rice and I felt so bad. And he started weeping. He burst into tears in front of them. And copiously he wept. And the young disciples, these young men who were there, they were astonished, taken aback. I mean, they didn't know what to make of this, you know. Uh, and obviously for Sri Ramakrishna it was absolute reality. And yet nobody else would ever see anything like that. But he saw it and the other monks saw it. Both of them saw the same thing. Um, finally, Jatadhari one day came to him and said, I am, he bought that image and he said, I'm going to give him to you. He has uh, revealed himself extraordinary in an extraordinary way last night or yesterday. And I see that I have no need of this formal worship in the image that uh, probably didn't explain exactly what he saw. He saw that Ram Lala is everywhere, God is everywhere. And now it's a permanent vision with him. And he wants to stay with you. So I will go, but I'll leave him with you. I know he's in good hands. So he gave his beloved Ram Lala image to Sri Ramakrishna. And then he left. Uh, and nobody ever saw him again. So the image was in the temple. Sri Ramakrishna gave the image to the temple of Dakshineshwar. Uh, it was there in the temple. Uh, until the turn of the century, last century, and when it was stolen and never recovered again. But the disciples, they say that after hearing these stories, we would go and stare at the <laughs> image, which they saw with their eyes, and well, it's just a nice, cute <laughs> image to us. But so this is one example of what would go on. And there were such remarkable characters around. Around this time came um, Haladhari. His name was Ram Tarak. He was a priest. He was related to Sri Ramakrishna. There was actually, they were cousins. He came from the village in search of employment. He was very well read. And he was a spiritual man too and very uh, learned. So Mathur Babu gave him the job of, uh, and because Sri Ramakrishna was now unable to do the worship of, of Kali properly, he was always in these ecstasies. The worship would never get done if you if he, <laughs> if he gave it to him. So they were looking for an alternate priest. So they gave it to Haladhari and to this uh, Haladhari is the name by which Sri Ramakrishna called Ram Tarak. Now, this Haladhari was an interesting character, very learned, but very proud of his learning, and uh, he had a sort of strange relationship with Sri Ramakrishna. At times, he felt the divine in his cousin. There is one time when, coming out of the temple, he had observed Sri Ramakrishna with Kali in the temple, and he was full of divine. Uh, fervor, um, Haladhari, he felt it. He felt the divine in him, in Sri Ramakrishna. He said, I'll never be, brother, I'll never be mistaken about you again. I know who you are, or I know what is inside you. And he fell at his feet. But Sri Ramakrishna was very humorous. He said, he said Haladhari would often say that, and then he would get mixed up. And so Sri Ramakrishna would say, uh, are you sure? You won't get mixed up again? He said, no, I'm sure this time. I know, I know who you are. But the, exactly the same thing happened. And Sri Ramakrishna would say that, Haladari would then go and sit down and take a little bit of snuff and then take out his Gita and start explaining it to a ga gathering of admiring people. And then he would be puffed up with his pride of learning and Sanskrit and all of that. And Sri Ramakrishna was not above pulling his leg. He's teaching the Gita and Sri Ramakrishna comes and says to him, Brother, what you are, what's there in those books? Um, I have experienced those things. And and uh, Haladhari says, you fool, keep quiet. You, because you're practically, you're illiterate. And you don't know what is this. Uh, you, you, uh, how dare you say such things? And then Sri Ramakrishna wouldn't let go. You know, he, he pokes him further. He says, oh, the one within. How do I know all these things? The one who is within, which you yourself, the um, subtext is you yourself said you sensed who is within me. The one who is within me. Uh, she tells me everything, what is there in the scriptures, or what is uh, um, you know, the meaning of Vedanta and all these texts. It's an implicit way of saying that he is an avatar, an incarnation, a special manifestation of God incarnation. And that would drive Haladhari to a rage. You claim to be an avatar, do you realize what you are saying, you fool? You are claiming to be an avatar. Uh, are you, have you completely lost your mind? 
Uh, does God re- in- incarnate so uh, easily, so cheaply? Don't you know in this age of Kali there is only one avatar, that is Kalki avatar. So that's part of the Vaishnava theology. But there was a, another seriously, um, there was a serious problem with Haladhari, which is he was a strict Vaishnava. And this was a Kali temple. He was asked to do the worship of Kali. There were uh, food offerings which were non-vegetarian, fish and meat. And there were occasional animal sacrifices, none of which he was um, horrified by this. He disliked it intensely. But it was his job, so he worshipped. But he worshipped with a kind of, somewhere, there was a disdain for, for this kind of thing, you know. Um, he was a strict vegetarian, and his worship was, his actual devotion was to Krishna, actually. Um, and then, he had this vision, uh, a mother in a terrifying form, appearing and warning him. Shortly afterwards, his son died. He got the information from his village. And he was stunned. He came to Sri Ramakrishna, broke down and confessed. that He says, I know what my failing is. Um, so, Sri Ramakrishna, I think he must have spoken to Mathur Baba and got him transferred from the Kali temple to the Krishna temple, the Radha, Kanta, the Radha Krishna uh, temple. And one day, that didn't solve it until Haladari one day said to Sri Ramakrishna, he, he was frank about it, you know, why do you worship this deity who is so terrifying? You know, <coughs> the appall- appalling power which Christopher, Christopher Isherwood mentions. Why do you worship this deity who is so terrifying? Now, Sri Ramakrishna was wounded. Anybody talking about his beloved mother like that? So his natural reaction was always to take all complaints to the mother. So he would straight away go to the Kali temple and say that this is what Haladar is saying, you know. And he went into an ecstasy and came running out of the temple. And he goes to Haladari who was in the Krishna temple worshipping. And Sri Krishna comes in this ecstasy and says, uh, um, I will never listen to you again. Mother has shown me that she is everything. He climbed on Haladari's shoulders <laughs> in his ecstasy and said, Mother has shown me that uh, she is everything in the universe and beyond everything she is pure love. So I will never listen to you again when you say such things. And Haladari to his credit was again overcome and he fell at his feet and asked for his, uh, Sri Ramakrishna's feet, asked for his forgiveness. And he didn't have these doubts uh, about it again. Sri Ramakrishna had a continuous on and off vision of, of Kali. For example, he would say, I would feel the breath, <laughs> literally, so anthropomorphic that I would hold my hand near the nostrils, I would feel the breath. I would see her smiling at me I would never ever see her shadow on the walls of the temple. I would hear in the evening um, the anklets on her feet as she ran upstairs. Uh, and to just to verify, he said, I, uh, he said, I ran out of the temple and he looked on the balcony of the temple. There, there she was. Sometimes she would be looking at the Ganga on this side, sometimes at Calcutta. And she said, there she was on the balcony with her long hair streaming in the wind. Kali. Um, Mathur Babu, who had very staunch devotion, a tremendous affection. He was older, so he had this kind of protective feeling about father, <laughs> about Sri Ramakrishna. Once, and that faith really, that really uh, spiritually elevated him. There was once he was sitting in his room, and across the um, courtyard, across the ga- grounds, there was Sri Ramakrishna's room, and he saw Sri Ramakrishna pacing up and down in a meditative mood. From his room he could see him. Something overcame him and Mathur ran across and fell in front of Sri Ramakrishna and held on to his feet and wept. Said, and Sri Ramakrishna was taken aback. He said, what are you doing? What will people think? Remember, he's the boss of the whole place and he is an aristocratic gentleman. Sri Ramakrishna is a paid priest. He's actually an employee of these people. What are you doing? Stop, stop. What are you doing? And Mathur Babu said, no, father, I have seen. When I was watching you walking, I suddenly saw as you were coming towards me, it was Kali. And as you turned back and walked away from me, it was Shiva. And this happened again and again. He says, I rubbed my eyes with my uh, hands. And uh, no, it was not my imagination. So he held on to the feet of Ramakrishna and wept. And Ramakrishna had to console him. And Ramakrishna said, I knew nothing of this. 
<laughs> and you know, I don't know why he thought this. So Ramakrishna would often be quite dismissive about these things. He said, I don't know anything. People say so. So Mathur Baba was even more uh, convinced about, uh, and especially after the death of uh, of the Rani, uh, Rani Rashmani, who passed in eight, passed away in 1861. At the end of her life, um, she uh, she had a vision of of Kali, because she the one some of the one of the last words she said was that uh, the lamps which had been lit around the dying queen. She said, take the lamps away. They do nothing. The whole room is lit by the presence of the Divine Mother. And she passed. Um, but there were troubles in the family, which continued for decades, even till recent times, um, you know, for property and the trusteeship of the temples within the family. And the family still continues, uh, Rani Rashmani's family. But after Rani Rashmani passed, it was all up to Mathur Baba to take charge of the whole thing and run the whole thing, as long as he lived. And he really took good care of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna would not accept gifts. He was ready to give all his property to Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna scolded him severely when he wanted to give anything. But sometimes there were very interesting incidents. Once, he got a ex very expensive shawl, a thousand rupees in those days, which is an extraordinarily um, high amount. Um, a shawl, a silken shawl, and he presented it to Sri Ramakrishna. That would be something like the top of the line from across the park, Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so, yes. What is this? Christian Dior and... Uh, and and so, I didn't know. Do you know all of them are owned by the same person? <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yes, yes. Anyway, uh, so this most expensive gift that he could find, and he gave it to um, Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna put it around himself, and he was very happy with it. He walked back and forth, and he said, he told his mind, he said, Oh, mind, see, this is what is called an expensive shawl. And... And then he said, but this is what makes people forget God. They become proud of themselves and they strut around and they forget God. So immediately, what use is it? He shrugged it off. And not only he didn't stop there, he threw it on the ground. He spat on it. Then he jumped on it. And then he was about to set fire to it when people had, uh, were alarmed and told Mathur Babu. They, they ran and snatched it away from him and rescued the poor shawl. <laughs> but... Although he couldn't give anything to Sri Ramakrishna directly, Mathur Babu spent a lot of money, you know, uh, for visiting monks and uh, feeding the poor. Uh, when Sri Ramakrishna wanted to go on a pilgrimage, Mathur Babu made huge arrangements and accompanied Sri Ramakrishna on the uh, one pilgrimage that he did to the north of India. All of these things he did. Um, he was very protective. Once Sri Ramakrishna went to a religious festival, Mathur Babu went in incognito behind him as a bodyguard so that he wouldn't come to any harm in Sri Ramakrishna. How protective he was, there's this story of Haldar, Chandra Haldar, who was another of the priests, but a sort of a low, cunning man. And he was jealous of Sri Ramakrishna. He thought, how is it that the big boss, you know, he listens to, uh, reveres this um, uh, young priest so much? And he thought that this Sri Ramakrishna has got some magic powers and pu has put a spell on uh, Mathur Babu. So one day, um, uh, getting an opportunity, he sneaked into Sri Ramakrishna's room. Nobody was around. And Sri Ramakrishna was in a semi, uh, you know, externally aw awareness, was, was semi-conscious externally. He was in an ecstatic state internally. So this Haldar kept on questioning him. Tell me, what have you done? How did you dupe the master, the you know, Mathur Babu, into uh, into obeying your every whim? Uh, why does he revere you so much? What spell have you cast on him? Sri Ramakrishna couldn't speak. He was so absorbed in this ecstasy. And that infuriated Haldar even more. She caught hold of Sri Ramakrishna and shook him. Tell me. And finally, in disgust, he kicked Sri Ramakrishna and he walked out of the place. Sri Ramakrishna never told anybody a, a word about this. Shortly afterwards, Haldar was dismissed in the course of events. He did something wrong and he was dismissed from service. So when he was gone, Sri Ramakrishna told Mathur Babu that this has actually happened quite some time back. And Mathur Babu said that if I had known father, I would have killed him. He said. Um, so that was the kind of protective uh, feeling he had. Like a child actually towards uh, Sri Ramakrishna. Um, there were so many other interesting incidents that 
So this kind of God intoxication, immersion in God continued. The, then comes a major event is the coming of uh, the Bhairavi. In between, of course, I will not go into that because we are talking about a particular theme, Sri Ramakrishna's God intoxication. But in between, what Indian parents have always done, if some, the um, son is too, or even daughter is too interested in spiritual life, they get them married off. So, they said Sri Ramakrishna is going crazy. His uh, mother thought, maybe if he gets married, his mind will come back to the world. And to their amazement, he had absolutely no objection. They thought he's become so monk-like, he won't marry. He, he had no objection. It seems he was sort of predestined. He even picked the bride in uh, a sort of way. And then he got married to Sharada Devi. But when he came back from his village after the marriage to Dakshineshwar, the same thing possessed him again. Day and night. His chest would always be flushed red. He would reel like a drunkard. He, day and night would seem the same to him. And he would be continuously present, uh, f filled with the presence of God all the time. It was awesome to behold. Sometimes in his ecstasies, it sounds very funny, but you can just imagine, uh, in his ecstasies, his hair would stand on its end. He says, <laughs> imagine there was a man with a beard and hair. Every hair on the body, his hair, his beard, and his hands, everything stood on its end <laughs> in, in ecstasy. I mean, he's having this uh, experience of God. Um, A development was one day, um, this lady, a sannyasini, she came to Dakshineshwar. They would come by boat. So she came by boat. And Sri Ramakrishna actually saw her coming and he was excited. It's like he ex knew exactly what was going to happen, who she was and why she had come. Because he always felt the Divine Mother told him all these things. He went and called Riday, his nephew, who was um, a very, uh, it's sort of, uh, somebody present there for us because he gave a very common uh, down-to-earth explanation of things. He was, he was a pretty worldly man. <laughs> he said, look, go there. And this sannyasini has come. He, he described her. Uh, he called her a Bhairavi, a worshipper of Shiva and Shakti, of Divine Mother especially, a tantric. She has come, call her to me, bring her to me. Uh, Hriday was a little uh, skeptical. He said, why should she come to you? She doesn't know you. Um, he said, she will. You just tell her my name. And Hridaya did that, and the Bhairavi came. And the Bhairavi is coming there immediately. She recognized, she seemed to recognize Sri Ramakrishna. He seemed to recognize her. She said that, my child, I've been looking all over for you, and I found you finally. Uh, the Divine Mother told me, there were three of you, uh, two I have already found, and you are the last one I was supposed to find. And they sat, and they talked, and talked, and talked. She had just come with, with a bundle of books. Sri Ramakrishna just you know, narrated every little intimate detail of what was going on with him. People were saying he's crazy and he himself felt, am I mad? Things like, for example, um, he said uh, there was a time when my, I couldn't close my eyes. He said I would stand in front of a mirror and try to close my eyelids and I couldn't. I just uh, stare continuously. Yeah. There's a particular stare in uh, eyes open samadhi. Uh, there are pictures of this actually. And it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's not difficult to detect. But those come and go. And for Sri Ramakrishna, it used to be constant for days and hours. He couldn't touch metal. His hand would bend if somebody gave a metal coin. Later on, Sri, uh, Swami Vivekananda actually tested it. One day Sri Ramakrishna had gone out and Vivekananda put a, metal, a, a coin under his bed. And Sri Ramakrishna came and when he was sitting down, he jumped up as if he had been stung by a scorpion. And they had to remove the bed and look what happened. They found the metal coin inside. And Vivekananda confessed. He was a little ashamed of what he had done. But Sri Ramakrishna said he was very happy. He said, good, you should test, test the guru. Uh, test the claims. Very empirical that way. So he confessed all of these. He said all of these things to Bhairavi. And um, she said, my child, it's not an illness. These are divine moods which come. Uh, for advanced spiritual seekers. Uh, and I'll show it. She opened the book and uh, showed these things to Sri Ramakrishna. The, it's written in uh, various Vaishnava, in the Tantras, these particular moods, in the Vaishnava scriptures also. There are these 19 great spiritual moods which come, various kinds. Usually they come to different spiritual practitioners who have practiced spiritual practices along that particular track. And that's the culmination. They generally don't come to one person. Uh, because uh, no matter how pure, how elevated the saint, 
a human body cannot withstand that kind of um, you know uh, spiritual fervor and ecstasy for a prolonged period of time but she also began to see that this is not just an advanced spiritual practitioner whom she is supposed to teach she is supposed to teach and she had got this vision earlier but she realized that something more was going on here it was not just an extraordinary spiritual phenomenon she began to suspect that once in a millennium occurrence the advent of a of an incarnation of god an avatar so avatar is different from other uh, spiritual beings there are great saints um great teachers of humanity some are perfected beings who come once in a while and teach us and all of that but an avatar is god and that is a very rare thing and krishna says in the bhagavad gita i come again and again when uh, dharma declines and adharma is on the ascendant i come to rescue spirituality for the benefit of the um, of the holy and for correcting the wicked i come i project myself i incarnate myself again and again on this earth on in this world into history basically avatar is incarnation of the divine into human history otherwise god is eternal unchanging but once in a while coming and going like a human being mathur babu recognized it actually when he, he was uh, there he he used to say fondly about his father quote and quote father who was <laughs> younger than he says he has a very beautiful bengali phrase which meant he has come to us from a country which knows no night he has come to come to us from a land of eternal light he is a visitor from a land of eternal light so the uh, bhairavi started teaching and she also watched sri ramakrishna carefully and she began to suspect that this is an incarnation of god this is an incredible claim claim to make it's not made uh, cheaply sri ramakrishna never would say, say such things at that time later on he would but what the bhairavi became increasingly convinced and she gave remedies to sri ramakrishna so the, for example sri ramakrishna would feel a burning all over his body and he thought it was some kind of nervous disease and the, the doctors the ayurveda doctors had treated it but nothing seemed to work and all the bhairavi said you have to put on this uh, garland of uh, flowers and put sandal paste marks sandal paste on your body he did that and the burning went away so she knew she said, these are things mentioned in the scriptures for very advanced spiritual masters and they get these signs in their body um sri ramakrishna said i hardly knew sleep for 6 long years day and night uh, he would be in nights he, his fervor would increase we get more and more sleepy he, he would be more and more awake at night when people would not be there now what the bhairavi did was she said i'm going to prove it to people this is very important like important for history and spiritual life in in religion this is very important the advent of someone like this she became more and more sure and the way they did it traditionally was to invite um invite scholars for a debate so the most noted scholars would be invited for a debate uh, where she said i would challenge them to show that this person in front of you is an incarnation of god and uh, Uh, is an incarnation of god and i will prove it with scriptural references so mathur babu was happy to organize it it's a big it's a big fe- it's like a festival uh, uh, this, this is something that was more common in ancient india there even now there are the, those things they called shastrarth uh, debate on uh, scriptural meaning so experts will gather and it's like a gladiatorial combat uh, but only at an intellectual level So among the scholars who were invited the two greatest scholars at that time in Bengal one was uh, Vaishnav Charan who was a saintly person a great scholar a Vaishnava a devotee of Krishna he was invited he came he already knew Sri Ramakrishna so, so it was maybe a little fixed in, internally <laughs> because he had great reverence for Sri Ramakrishna uh, but as a saint he didn't probably know that he was an avatar and the other person who was invited was Gauri Pandit who was a tantric so both were invited first vaishnav charan came a f- few days before uh, gauri pandit and so there was a preliminary round of discussions um the, uh, the bhairavi gave all evidence from the scriptures and vaishnav charan agreed he said i am of the same opinion as you um that this here we have an incarnation of of god sri ramakrishna was 
he was like a child sitting right there and he had a little bag of spices little spice, and he would pop one into his mouth and listen carefully <laughs> and when he felt that vaishnav charan was not quite getting it he would tug at vaishnav charan's cloth and explain little more no i experienced these things in this way Vaishnav Charan was sold. He was com- he was uh, convinced about it that Sri Ramakrishna and he fell at Sri Ramakrishna's feet and uh, in front of everybody and said that I I firmly regard you as an incarnation of God. That there's incarnation of God here. Sri Ramakrishna said, "Oh well, at least it's not a disease." <laughs> he was not very very Im- I mean not mo- very moved by it. Then g- came um, Gauri Pandit, the tantric. Uh, this uh, tantric he had extraordinary powers as befits a great tantric. So one of the powers was the traditional homa, the sacrificial fire, which you put um, firewood and light the fire and then put offerings. Um, he would do it on his hand. So he would take the uh, firewood on his hand, left hand, and light a fire there, hold it, and uh, make all the offerings on his outstretched hand. It's heavy, so much of, and then it's burning. It's extremely hot. I can tell you, having performed the not on my hand, the, the usual way, it's it's quite hot. Even sitting a little distance away from it to perform it on your hand without getting burnt, I don't know how. And then it takes time, more than an hour, to stand like that, and it intense concentration and this mass of burning wood on your hand and perform the whole. Sri Ram, we have it on Sri Ramakrishna's own account. Who says he saw Gauri Pandit do that? Another peculiar and extraordinary power that Gauri Pandit had was, among this range of superhuman abilities, was he had a, uh, a supernatural way, unique way of winning debates like this one. So the, the power was, when he would enter the debate hall, he would chant a mantra to the Divine Mother, and then these syllables, ha re re, with a booming, with a deep and booming voice. And he would slap his left shoulder with his right palm like this. It's usually a challenge by traditional Indian wrestlers. They challenge the opponent like that. And he would do this in a, with a roar and with a very peculiar kind of voice which would resonate everywhere. And that would make all his opponents go lifeless. They would, they would forget their arguments. They would, ha- lose their, <laughs> they would lose their will to debate him and they would finally give up. Now, Sri Ramakrishna didn't know about it at that time. He reported it later. So when Gauri Pandit approached for the first round of debate, Vaishnav Charan was more or less on the side of the Bhairavi. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting there. Gauri Pandit comes and he roars, Ha, re, re. Something possessed Sri Ramakrishna who jumped up himself suddenly and he slapped his <laughs> <laughs> left uh, shoulder and he roared even more loudly, Ha, re, re. And then Gauri, Gauri Pandit was so taken aback, he had never seen somebody who knew this, his secret. He tried once again, ha, re, re, and Sri Ramakrishna outroared him. <laughs> and that, uh, the whole hall boomed with, and, and the guards at the gate of the uh, temple, they thought dacoits had, had uh, attacked. And they came uh, running with uh, arms, you know, with uh, sticks and swords and all. And then they saw what was going on, they burst out laughing and they went back. And the Gauri Pandit was uh, defeated, I mean, because his, he felt his power go out of him. And that power left him forever. He couldn't use it ever again. <laughs> but when the debate started, again, this happened very soon. He was himself uh, convinced of the presence of the Divine Mother whom he worshipped in this form. And he finally uh, agreed uh, with Vaishnav Charan and Bhairavi Brahmani. And the conclusion of the scholars was that this is indeed an incarnation of God. Years later, years later, decades later actually, when Ram Dutta and some others, Girish Kosh, who became convinced that Sri Ramakrishna was an avatar and this sort of sort of things started spreading, people got to know about it. That's how um, the principal of the Scottish Church College referred the young Narendra Nath to Sri Ramakrishna. He says, the person who has actually experienced these spiritual ecstasies, there's one I know genuinely who lives in that Kali temple of Dakshineshwar. Go and see. Uh, so when people were actually spreading it around, that he, here is an incarnation of God actually, Sri Ramakrishna was dismissive. He said, one is a lawyer, the other is a, uh, is a theater performer, and they talk about who is an incarnation, who is not an incarnation. Decades before you lot came, there were these great scholars and great spiritual masters who came and 
debated this thoroughly and came to this conclusion. This was this happened long before these young devotees gathered around Sri Ramakrishna. By the way, that's also something that um, the Divine Mother revealed to him that a group of close devotees who are real spiritual practitioners would gather around Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna happily he told he would tell everybody he, he went and told Ridai that such people are coming, and uh, Ridai said that's good, Uncle. We'll all be very happy all together in your company. Uh, but that didn't happen for more than a decade after, uh, after he said this. Um, then comes some, um, and there are so many uh, stories here. He is Hanuman Bhava. <laughs> so he was doing sadhana in the form of Han but the Bhairavi Brahmani put him through a range of tantric disciplines, very difficult, more and more difficult than the other. The whole range of tantric disciplines through which he already uh, he had this realization, the Divine Mother. He had it again in those paths. But he does this thing about him that not only learned from his gurus, but he taught them also. So they were his mentors, but he, he would see where they were stuck in their spiritual path, maybe something more that he, they needed to know, and he would clear up that path for them. So in turn, he would become the guru. One day he decided that he wanted to practice the bhava of Hanuman, the um, devotee of Rama. And he knew no limits. There are no limits to which he would not go. So he tied his dhoti in the form of a tail. So that it's like a uh, monkey's tail. And he walked with a peculiar um, hop. And he said he spent uh, quite a lot of time on the branches of the trees. Uh, and he ate fruits, and which he did not want to be cut or peeled. So like a Hanuman, the, the monkey. And he would say, Ram, with a deep and sonorous voice. And he says, I, his eyes took on a red uh, bloodshot and restless look, like a, like a monkey's eyes. People, of course, thought, there he goes again. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But he says, the incredible thing was, the, um, uh, the coccyx, the end of the spine, uh, he says, in my case, it elongated a couple of inches, just like a tail. Uh, what do you call a prehensile tail? As long as I was in that mood, the body, his body would, would be like, uh, you know, it would respond to his strong uh, moods, spiritual moods. It would get transformed that way. And he says once that Hanuman mood went away, that, uh, that elongation of the spine also disappeared. It's incredible. You know, when I'm saying all these things, it sounds very different from the non-dual, pure consciousness. <laughs> and the, yeah. This is mysticism at its peak. There was this book I was mentioning last time. Uh, a gentleman has written, Ramakrishna and uh, Christ, super mystics. So, R Ramakrishna was a super mystic. There's uh, uh, extraordinary mystical experiences. See, as if a demonstration for this age, a demonstration for this age which is primarily atheistic, ag agnostic, the more educated you are, the more cool you are, the more Manhattan or Paris you are, the <laughs> less you would be likely to believe in these things. Richard Dawkins was asked this question that, uh, why do you speak about atheism? Only a tiny fraction of humanity, less than 1%, you know, after com communist Russia and communist China, um, you, know, you set them aside. Less than 1% of humanity are declared atheists. So why do you speak about atheism? He said, yes, that's true, 1%, but which 1%? And then he said, um, it's one percent of the global population, but there was an, uh, a poll conducted among the living Nobel laureates. And more than 80 percent of them, or 90 percent of them, 80 or 90 percent, said that they didn't believe in God. And then he's, Dawkins says, you draw your conclusions. The smarter you are, the less likely, likely you are to believe in God. If you believe in God, you're likely to be dumb. <laughs> That's our age. That's our age. It's an age of atheism, age of agnosticism. Somebody said, no, at no time in human history had there been so many people on this planet as a fraction of the population, as a percentage of the population, who are agnostic, not interested, or outright atheistic about the question of God or spirituality. It required this extraordinary, in-your-face demonstration people here are willing to sign up for Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, because it's sophisticated, it's kind of cool, it is cool. <laughs> it's the coolest thing I know. <laughs> and 
and uh, yes, even committed atheists like uh, Sam Harris, they don't see a problem with it. Or they sign up for some form of Buddhism, which doesn't require you to believe in God. But here is another path, there's another option, where Sri Ramakrishna demonstrates not minimalistic spirituality, not just the Everest peak of non-dual uh, impersonal realization, but a full-blooded, full-spectrum spirituality that all the things that religion said in ancient times till today, to you oh-so-smart modern people, they are all true. They are all true. It required this demonstration, this stunning demonstration in our day and age, to be recorded and watched by people and who would live uh, who, who lived almost contemporary with us and would give these uh, uh, testimony that it is true god does exist what the religions of the world say not one all of them are true in their highest sense in the sense of uh, at the core of these religions that uh, the spiritual truth yeah in the practices theologies they are very very different but the fact that there is a spiritual reality, that God does exist, that spiritual experience is possible, a tremendous demonstration, a lifelong demonstration, immersed in God. I know of this uh, South Indian mystic who left his diaries behind. He was a famous monk in uh, uh, Karnataka at one time. I've forgotten the name. But what struck me was, another monk told me, when he passed, they found his diaries, which were published later on. And so he writes about his life, this uh, contemporary monk. Why did he become interested in religion? Why did he become a monk and then finally a religious teacher? The reasons, how he came to believe in God. First reason um, is scripture, the Vedas say so. The traditional arguments, the scripture say so. Second reason, the universe itself, that there must be a um, profound cause of this universe. Uh, so this is a logical argument. But the third argument which he gives is, is very touching. Why did he come to believe in God, that it's real? Number three, he writes, Sri Ramakrishna. He doesn't say the life of Sri Ramakrishna, or the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, the implication of... Just this phenomenon. Just take a look at this. Christopher Isherwood begins his book by saying this is the story of a phenomenon, of a spiritual phenomenon. Next comes our Totapuri. The non-dual Vedanta. We have run out of time. No, it just says it's 11.10, so I've just begun. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, but I'll, I'll quickly uh, run through the, that part, the non-dual part. So ne next, Sri Ramakrishna senses somebody else has come. And uh, Tozapuri going by the uh, boat, he was the uh, traditional non-dual uh, teacher of the teacher of Advaita Vedanta, w one of a monk of the Puri sect the Puri lineage, ten orders of monks which had been set up uh, tracing their origins back to Shankaracharya uh, 1200 years ago. So uh, he, which is why we are all here today actually. So this is important because we are all monks of the Puri uh, sect. Uh, so my name technically should be Swami Sarvapriyananda Puri. We don't use it but it, technically that's correct. That's how it should be written. And how it should be said also, how I'm supposed to introduce myself. I remember in the high Himalayas one day, I went to meet this uh, Naga monk. I wanted to meet a Naga monk. A Naga monk is uh, one of those naked ones, like uh, somewhat like Todapuri himself. So somebody told me that near the bridge there, there's one, uh, you can go and talk to him. He's a genuine one. So I went there and this monk, in that cold he was sitting, he was not completely naked, he was wearing a loincloth and he had their traditional fire going which... Uh, Totapuri would have the sacred fire, Dhuni, going there, and he's sitting there. I um, asked him his name, and he said, uh, uh, Purnam Giri. Purnam Giri. So, Giri is one of the lineages. Puri, Giri, Saraswati, and so on. Purnam Giri. And then he said to me, he was a fierce, uh, like an angry bird. <laughs> a little skinny, but sharp. He looked at me and he said, Tera naam kya hai? What's your name? I said, uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda. And he was immediately furious. He said, Sarvapriyananda? Puri kaha gaya? Sabji ke saath kha gaya? <laughs> where is... So that is, uh, the humor has to be translated. He said, where is the Puri? Now, Puri has another meaning. Multiple meanings, actually. It's, it's the monastic title for our lineage. But it also means... What? Uh, 
uh, the flat, the fried bread, dough. The, fried dough. the fried dough, which you eat. Uh, so he said, where is the puri? Did you eat it with your vegetables? <laughs> uh, have you swallowed it up? I said, oh, I'm sorry. I am Sarva Priyananda Puri. And then he said, ah, Babu ban gaya. You've become a dandy. <laughs> Why don't you say your whole name? So Toda Puri came. And he saw Sri Ramakrishna, this young man, sitting on the bank of the river. And he noticed immediately that same recognition. This is a highly advanced spiritual adept. And he could benefit from non-dual teachings. And he goes up to Sri Ramakrishna. He was a very imperious man. He, Sri Ramakrishna would never refer to him by name. Uh, because it is a traditional Indian thing. You don't refer to your guru by name. Your husband by name, by the way. And uh, who else? Parents by name. You don't call your parents by name. They're sort of gone out of fashion now. Um, so he calls, uh, to, to the, he would call Todapuri the naked one because he couldn't use the direct name. So Todapuri would go around, start naked. Uh, and he was this, he was a Punjabi, a tall, powerful man, a Naga sannyasi, a Naga also. Technically, though, I don't know if that is quite correct, but anyway. So Todapuri comes up to him rather imperiously asks, Would you like to learn non dual Vedanta? And Sri Ramakrishna says, I don't know, I have to ask my mother. <laughs> okay, go and ask your mother, I don't have much time. And so he runs off to the Kali temple. Todapuri thought he would ask, he's going to ask his earthly mother, who was also, by the way, in the Dakshineshwar temple at that time, Chandra Devi. And then he comes back, Sri Ramakrishna, and he says, the mother has told me, yes, you have been sent here to teach me um, uh, non-dual Vedanta, so I, I am to learn this from you. Sotapuri was a little amused and, you know, all this mother and God and all of this, this child's play. I mean, it's not wrong, but it's for dummies. <laughs> so his attitude was, I'm going to teach you the real thing now. And so they sat and uh, Sri Ramakrishna said, day and night we talked about Vedanta. He taught, told me about non-dual Vedanta, how I'm not the body, I'm the witness of the body, of the mind. I'm this limitless ex Brahman of existence, consciousness, place. The method of Viveka, the philosophical discernment, the method of insight. And Todaburi would teach me morning and evening and night. Sri Ramakrishna had this habit at, at some so intense discussion of Vedanta, but at uh, sunset every day, he would uh, clap his hands and take the name of Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, uh, Gopala, Gopala, Hari, Hari, like this he would take. And he would, he would teach uh, everybody, when the sun set, quick, quick, take the name of God. And how he would see when it's time for taking the name of Krishna is, he had a very interesting way, a heuristic way, I think. He would say, if you cannot see the individual hairs of your uh, hand by the sunlight, if get, that's the time when you should start, uh, you know, taking the name of God. So here was Totapuri uh, teaching him non-dual Vedanta, that you are Brahman. Suddenly he starts, <laughs> Krishna, Krishna, Hari. To the annoyance of Todapuri, and he Todapuri snaps at him. Kya, uh, chapati pakate ho. Uh, uh, chapa now in North India, so chapatis are the flat rice, and that's the um, that's the poorer cousin of the puri. That, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, so chapati is uh, the staple food people take in North India at night, and it's the same thing, but it's flat. A monk of our order who's who's Dutch. The first time he saw chapati, he called it a UFO, unidentified flat object. <laughs> <laughs> so, now the way they do it in the villages in North India is over a fire, they would do it like this. So when Sri Ramakrishna started taking the name of Krishna, <laughs> Stodapuri um, pokes fun at him. He says, what are you doing? Are you making your chapati, <laughs> the evening chapati? And Sri Ramakrishna said, what are you saying? I'm taking the name of, of Krishna. I'm taking the name of God. Why are you saying that? Um, they would have these discussions um, on, on Vedanta and Totapur would say, Brahman is the only reality. This whole world is an appearance. And it's appear appearing because of Maya. But once you realize that you are Brahman, Maya has no hold on you. Sri Ramakrishna said, I would tend to disagree because don't underestimate the power of Maya. When they were talking like this, and there was fire blazing in front, the night watchman, who had a hookah, he wanted a coal to light his hookah. So he just came casually by. He didn't know that this Dhuni fire is sacred to, the, um, to this order of monks, wandering monks. So he picked out with, um, that <laughs> coal, and he put it in ember, and he put it in his hookah, to the fury of Totapuri, who jumped up and said, how dare you? 
and he had these tongs you know he threatened him with the tongs and the poor night watchman he <laughs> ran for his life because this is this uh, the giant naked man <laughs> in, in the uh, in the light of the dancing flames you know and with his long beard and hair and threatening him with tongs sri ramakrishna started clapping his hands in glee and rolling on the dust uh, on, on on the ground and todapuri was I was asking him, "What's so funny? What did you find? The man was insolent, don't you see?" I said, "Yes, but where is your knowledge of Brahman? Just now you were saying that Maya cannot overcome you, and here you are <laughs> ready to chase and beat that poor man." And Sri Ram, but uh, Todapuri, to his credit, he says he sits down and says, "You're right. Anger is a deadly enemy, and I henceforth give it up." And nobody ever saw Todapuri angry again. See, this is the difference. These advanced yogis and enlightened ones. there might be something that might be wrong or but they have such control over themselves once they take a decision they give it up and that and they change it immediately and it's done it's done but for us it's not done <laughs> i remember when in my college days you know, those uh, kids got nowadays it's great that people don't smoke it's gone out of fashion but that was the time when kids were learning to smoke and uh, then there would be a struggle of giving it up somebody said i've given up smoking and a friend of mine said i've given it up so many times what's the big deal <laughs> <laughs> so we also have given up anger lust greed so many times todapuri gave it up sri ramakrishna appreciated todapuri's uh, his realization todapuri was a master of um, and he was enlightened and also nirvikalpa samadhi um at he would meditate all night long sri ramakrishna once asked him you are enlightened why do you still meditate so much Dodapuri pointed to his brass pot and he said see you have to scrub it every day then it retains its shine in the same way the mind has to be centered in the reality brahman otherwise a layer of maya forms over it you know that i am adding he didn't say that sri ramakrishna had to come back to that sri ramakrishna said yes it's for a brass pot but if the pot was made of gold you wouldn't need to do that right um what is the meaning of that two interpretations i mean i have one is was he saying that for an incarnation of god you don't need to do that it's gold he is himself gold or as a final uh, culmination of uh, non dual knowledge itself you have to go beyond the need for samadhi maybe that also so swami brahmananda actually says the latter so that then that raises the question totapuri was fully enlightened as far as non dual knowledge was concerned he was fully enlightened so what does it mean that what is the pot of gold then anyway um once totapuri funny story he was sitting and meditating at night all quiet except the hooting of the owls which perched on the spires of the temple this is christopher isherwood you know, describing it and sri ramakrishna himself described it later on um so totapuri sitting and meditating suddenly there was a movement in the branches of the tree under which which he was sitting and this tall figure comes out luminous spectral um and comes in front of him todapuri asks who are you and he says i am a guardian i am a uh, the guardian spirit of shiva bhairava and i stay in the tree there and i protect this place and uh, todapuri said good i'm meditating on brahman sit here and meditate <laughs> uh, nobody wants to meditate because the that spirit immediately gave a loud laugh and disappeared <laughs> later on the next day he told sri ramakrishna that this happened last night and sri ramakrishna said yes he lives there i know uh, we we talk sometimes and he tells me things which will happen in the future he told me once that the english were planning to build to buy this whole land and planning to build a powder magazine there like a arms depot there and i became very agita- agitated thinking that oh then i won't be able to call on the divine mother maybe the temple will be displaced and then mathur babu he um, fought the thing in court and uh, the bhairava he says he told me that uh, the british will lose the um, the legal battle and the temple will be safe and that's exactly what happened <laughs> so <laughs> now sri ramakrishna uh, uh, todapuri said you have to attain nirvikalpa samadhi to appreciate the your nature as brahman and he taught him and sri ramakrishna sat in meditation at night oh todapuri initiated in into monasticism so that's why we are all monks and the disciple that particular lineage todapuri sri ramakrishna puri and so all the monks sarvapriyanda puri so that's why we are here as monks today 
initiated him into monasticism. But Sri Ramakrishna there also had a condition. He said, don't tell anybody because I don't want my mother to know. She's an old mother who stays there. She'll feel very hurt if she thinks that I've become a monk. And especially uh, what's wrong in that is monks were wandering monks. Totapuri himself never stayed more than three days wherever he went. But 11 months he spent with Sri Ramakrishna. He wouldn't give, give up his attraction to Sri Ramakrishna. But we you know, all know the story how Sri Ramakrishna sat in the dead of the night. Totapuri told him how to withdraw his mind, how to meditate. But every time he tried to meditate, he already was an expert in samadhi. But the vision of his blissful mother, Kali, it would always come to him. He couldn't transcend that. And Totapuri said in exasperation, first, it's interesting, Totapuri would give him the steps of reasoning and then tell him to meditate. It's exactly like Shravana Manana Nidhyasana. He would show him Reason it out, see that it's real, stay with it and shut down everything else. He said, but one thing he could not shut down was the form of Kali. And Tozapuri said, why won't you be able to do it? You must do it. He had a piece of broken glass which was on the floor in that hut. He picked it up and he pierced his uh, forehead with it. He said, focus here and then do what I told you to do. And Sri Ramakrishna did that and again the blissful form of Kali came up. He says, I took the sword of knowledge and cut that form in half. And my mind disappeared into that luminous void into Brahman. Tadapuri saw that his disciple was in Samadhi. So he quietly left the hut and he locked it from outside. That hut is still there. It's now they made it a permanent structure. They, they, he locked it outside so that nobody would disturb him in Samadhi. He waited outside for the call. The day passed into afternoon, into evening, into night. Next day, next day, three days passed. No sign of life from within. So Todapuri was astonished. He opened the hut and he went inside and he found Sri Ramakrishna sitting there absolutely still. His heartbeat had stopped and everything like a dead body, but a face was luminous. And Todapuri marveled. He said, what is this? It took me 30 years to just glimpse this state. And here is this, within days he is uh, absorbed in samadhi and such an unbreakable samadhi. So Totapuri finally, he knew how to bring a person out of that state. So he chanted Hari Om loudly in his ears. And Sri Ramakrishna finally came to um, external awareness. Totapuri embraced him and saying that you have attained this highest non-dual realization. Totapuri left afterwards and there was this interesting uh, story which I will not repeat, how Sri Ramakrishna convinced Totapuri that not only the non-dual Brahman is real, but his divine mother, the manifestation of this world is also, uh, it's the, it is none other than Brahman itself. You can climb up the uh, house, leave the first floor behind, leave the staircase behind and reach the f roof of the house. But then you realize what you left behind is made of the same materials as the roof, the same concrete and wood and all of that. So he says, in the same way, you leave the world behind and reali realize the ultimate reality, existence, consciousness, bliss. But then you look back and you see what you had left behind is exactly that same thing. And that's the Divine Mother. It's a then it's the play of the Divine Mother. Realize that, realize your real nature as non-dual Brahman and then live the rest of your life as a play with the Mother, the Mother of this universe. After Totapuri left, finally, um, Sri Ramakrishna lived in Samadhi in and out for a long time for nearly six months he says in normally human beings 21 days they would die a uh, normal human body but he lived like that luckily a monk came who recognized the signs that this is not a dead body uh, and he would feed him force some food down his uh, mouth and feed him and that's how the body survived he came out of that and he had a vision of the divine mother who told him to stay in Bhava Mukha, henceforth from now on. Bhava Mukha is a special spiritual state where you are conscious of the ultimate reality, that Brahman, you are that. But you are also aware of the divinity in the form of this world. So that's how the avatar actually exists. Fully <coughs> absorbed in the ultimate reality, but also uh, open to this world and able to transmit, teach and guide people to that reality. He would explain this in um, little uh, parables, analogies later on. He says, suppose there is a vast wall and you don't know what's on the other side of the wall. And you come across a hole in the wall through which you can see the infinite beyond. And he says, the avatar incarnation is the hole in the wall. Swami Brahmananda said, this time he has come as a bridge between the jiva and shiva. Jiva, sentient beings like us, shiva, the ultimate reality. So this is the avatar incarnation, uh, who, through whom 
And another example he gave was of the steamship, which can ferry thousands of people across the ocean of life. He says, ordinary spiritual masters are like a floating piece of wood. He said, even if a crow sits on it, the wood sinks. It can float across by itself somehow, delicately. But it can't help others. You can instruct others, but you have to do it yourself. But the avatar incarnation actually can carry thousands across. Mm. I'll end with a little anecdote and uh, a s a stop. There was this great monk whom I really revered, um, who has passed, um, Upen Maharaj. He was a disciple of Swami Shivananda. And he was around 100 years old when, at the time of this story. So one day I was wheeling him around on his wheelchair in, in our main monastery in Belurmat. And uh, um, there's this story that, no, sorry, it actually happened. He was blessed by Swami Ranganathananji. This is your last life. You will attain liberation in this life. So I was, to cut a long story short, as I was wheeling him along, I said to him, sort of half jokingly, so you are free, Swami. What about the rest of us? <laughs> what about the rest of us? I still remember wheeling him along. The main temple of Belurmat was there. He took it seriously. I was joking, actually. What about the rest of us? He said, after a moment's silence, this time, this time, this, in this incarnation, this time, by the grace of the mother, many will cross across, will, will cross the ocean of life, samsara. So I take it as a, uh, as a blessing, as a, a sign of great hope for thousands to come for decades and centuries yet as, as the power of this incarnation. It will persist until the next incarnation comes. That's the incar incarnationology. <laughs> yes. One Swami said, see, Brahmananda says, See how easy it has become now to realize God. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda. May they bless all of us. May their blessings be on us in our spiritual journey. And may that the realm, the, the land of no night, may they take us to that land of no night, the land of eternal light. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Another story, uh, just to keep the kids engaged. <laughs> Another story which I like particularly, is a very cute story of the monk who came um, to Dakshineshwar. Sri Ram Krishna narrates, his face was lit with the knowledge of God that he was clearly an enlightened being. And he lived a very simple life in a hut for a few days that he stayed in Dakshineshwar. And he had this book, which he kept very carefully. And he would read this book with intense concentration. So I became curious and I went up to him and begged him to show me what was written in that book. And he, he said, I was amazed to see throughout that book, only Om Rama was written on every page in red letters. Om Rama, Om Rama. And he used to read that with intense concentration. And that monk said, what is the need of so many books? Everything is here. So that's at the end of all you know, enormous studies and thinking and spiritual practice, you come to this conclusion. I remember reading in the Reader's Digest this gentleman who... Um, was a professor of literature. He had all the books in his house. When he retired, he gave away most of his books except the great classics of Western literature. Then, towards the end of his life, he gave away those also. All he had. He said, now all I need is my rocking chair and my Bible. See, this, this is a sign of spiritual maturity. Not straight away. It won't happen that fast. <laughs> straight away, go to the Om Rama only, he'll fall asleep. That's all that's going to happen. We need all of that exercise. But then ultimately you have to come to that. Uh, another great monk, Bhikshu uh, Shankarananda, who lived in uh, Rishikesh about 70 or 80 years ago. So he just lived on a little cot, uh, what in North India they call Charpoy. He didn't even have a, um, have a cottage or a cave to stay in and lived under a tree. Because he was a great non-dualist, somebody asked him, that all these non-dualists, they have so many books, you know, they read books. and uh, Where are your books? And he said, 
and I promise this is the last anecdote. He said, <laughs> he said, um, I have three books. I read them every day. They are waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Jagrat Swapna Sushupti. And they all tell me I am this limitless consciousness which experiences all of them. Huh? Thank you so much. Thank you.